Welcome to our third talk, Scientific Machine Learning Overview and Discussion of Applications in Petroleum Engineering. And today we invited Dr. John Foster from University of Texas at Austin. And before he starts to give his talk, I provide you with this short bio sketch. And before joining UT Austin, John was a faculty member in mechanical engineering at UTSA and was a senior member of the technical staff at Sandia National Lab. He received his BS and MS in mechanical engineering from Texas Tech University and a PhD from Purdue University. He's a registered professional engineer in the state of Texas and the co-founder and CTO of Datum, a tech-enabled professional education company for data science and machine learning targeting the energy industry. So welcome, John. Thank you. Thanks. Patrick for the introduction. So today I'm gonna to give a high level talk on my perspectives on scientific machine learning, kind of provide some definitions around that, uh, as well as discuss some of the applications we begin to look into in petroleum engineering. Now, these are, um, you know, fairly sort of entry level applications, um, you know, one, one, two dimensional things, but I think that uh, as time progresses, we've only begun to look at this over the last couple of years. And I think as time progresses that uh, these applications could have a big impact on the digital transformation of the oil and gas industry. So what is scientific machine learning or uh, SciML has kind of been the, the uh, coined uh, way of, of describing what we're talking about here. And so over on the left, you know, if we talk about the kind of traditional computational science and engineering it's typically done through the forward or direct solution of ODEs and PDEs. Um, so, you know, as an example illustration there, I, I've shown the, the discretization of a petroleum reservoir. Uh, and these would typically be solved, you know, at least uh, in, the, in the most complex versions, you know, by solving coupled systems of equations that describe conservation of mass momentum uh, energy in the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, on the other side, we have statistical estimation and uh, kind of what most people uh, get excited about these days with respect to statistical estimation or machine learning is uh, neural networks. So that's why I put a little neural network uh, diagram there to represent that. And uh, you know, what's in the middle is what we're gonna call scientific machine learning. And I have some more uh, concrete examples uh, in mathematical terms on the next slide, but basically, you know, this is at the, sits at the intersection of forward physics-based, you know, forward traditional science and engineering computation and data science and machine learning. And, and where those two intersect is what we refer to as scientific machine learning or SciML. So the first example is something that's been done for a long time. I, I worked at Sandia, uh, you know, 15 years ago and used to use, uh, they have, Sandia has a piece of software called Dakota, which is a design optimization toolkit. And Deco Dakota had these capabilities 15 years ago before any of the popular, uh, you know, before machine learning or AI were buzzwords or before any of the popular uh, frameworks for deep learning were developed. Uh, Dakota would often do these kinds of things, where basically you would use uh, you would use synthetic data generated by forward simulation. So, over on the left of the of the uh, two arrow sign there, uh, we have just a, like a traditional ODE uh, that we're going to use to generate some data using the forward simulation. So we'll solve the ODE. We'll use that to generate some data that will then stick into um, a machine learning framework to develop surrogate models. So again, like I mentioned, Dakota could do this 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and in this case, we, we have U, which is the data, and we have some surrogate model, U hat, some estimation of U uh, parameterized by some unknown parameters or you know, uh, theta. And again, this could be a neural network, but it could be many other types of statistical estimators as well. So this has been done, done a long time uh, already, um, where we're just gonna generate synthetic data that is typically computationally expensive 
and use that to then build a surrogate model uh, to make decisions more rapidly with, okay? So that's one example that would fall into my definition of scientific machine learning. Now, the, the next few examples are a little more, uh, a little more modern. Um, so the first one here uh, is the so-called physics-informed neural networks. And so if you notice, uh, the first term I have here, uh, and this would be some type of uh, objective function that you're looking to minimize with an estimator. Uh, the first term here is identical to the term before. This is like your typical, you know, normed uh, quantity between the, the, the data U and some estimation of the, the data parameterized by theta in, in some norm. And often this is like the mean squared error. It's a common norm that's used. But, uh, but in general, it could be any kind of LP norm. Uh, when in a physics-informed neural network, we, we add to the objective function the balance law, right? So if you notice th this is just a, a rewritten form of this ODE up here, in which case we're now uh, forcing the, the estimated U uh, to also satisfy the balance law, again, in, with you know, some, some norm, norm quality, quantity. Um, and this has become popular over the last few years and uh, have gained a lot of um, interest in the kind of traditional compute, co computational mechanics literature um, and sh have shown some utility. And I have more to say about these in the future uh, in, some, in some slides. We've, we've looked at these to some extent. So uh, I think I'll save, uh, save any further discussion of those until later. Um, there's also this so-called uh, neural differential equations where basically on the right-hand side of the equation, you replace the right-hand side of the equation with some estimator, or again, neural network, in this case, parameterized by the weights and biases theta. Um, or uh, the, maybe the most general form here is what we would, or what's been termed a universal differential equation. And that is, uh, in addition to, you know, just representing the entire uh, right-hand side of the balance law with the neural network, we could have maybe only a partial component of the right-hand side represented with the neural network and otherwise keep our traditional functions of U. And this could be like F could represent some differential operator on U where the neural network, for example, could be some constitutive model. And, and also have a, a, an example of that as well. So I have more to say about all these, but these kind of uh, encompass some of the ideas that we're talking about when I say scientific machine learning. So I'm gonna start uh, with my favorite example, uh, uh, and the reason is I'm going to refer to some literature on this and they use these equations, but they didn't get to use the emoji versions that I created here. Uh, and I just cannot resist putting emoji equations in my slides. So uh, th the other thing I, I like about these equations is, you know, despite the, the, what my, uh, my emojis in them, is that the, the, the dynamics of these uh, equations are easy to understand. So these are the Lotka-Volterra equations, and they're used often in ecological models to uh, represent species dynamics. And the reason I say they're e easy to understand is uh, if you if you say were to just um, neglect the coupling terms, so the beta and the delta term in these two in the two equations, uh, such that they were decoupled, what these equations would say is that the time rate of change of of uh, rabbits. In, in the ecological environment would increase exponentially, right? Uh, if, there were, if there were no coupling, rabbits would just continue to, to increase. And likewise, uh, if there were no coupling, uh, you know, if there were no rabbits to eat, well, if there were wolves in an isolated um, environment, or foxes rather, in an isolated environment, then those would just decay exponentially, right? Uh, but we have these two coupling terms that couple, and so any exponential growth in rabbits is 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 um, is regulated by the fact that the foxes eat the rabbits, eat some of the rabbits, and uh, and and then likewise, you know, the 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 exponential die off of of the the foxes is the, is regulated by the fact that they have food that is rabbits. Right? And uh, these equations have interesting dynamics, um, but the thing that's often um, sort of 
guesswork is those coupling terms, right? We, the coupling terms are really complex and in, in how in, in how real species interact in, in an enclosed environment like that. And so because we don't often know the exact coupling terms or constitutive closure laws, if you will, um, one idea might be to replace them with, uh, instead of you know having some explicit function, you could replace them with some type of neural network. And so uh, that's what was done uh, by these uh, Chris Rakakis and, and et al. Uh, at MIT, which uh, are from the Julia group there. Um, and and they, that's where they termed this or coined this uh, phrase, universal differential equations for scientific machine learning. So again, if you notice, they didn't replace the entire right-hand side with neural networks, just these coupling terms between the rabbits and foxes. And what's interesting about this is if then you train, uh, so you, you use the real solution of the equations to create some training data to train those neural network coupling terms, then they can predict into the future uh, quite well. And so what you'll notice here is that because of these species dynamics equations, you know, the, the, the number of, in, case, in their case, they use X and Y, but they represent rabbits and foxes, right? So the number of rabbits increase until the foxes eat them. And, uh, and then the foxes, they, there's some delay, the foxes increase. Uh, and then they, they begin, they've eaten too many rabbits, so they begin to die off and you get these oscillatory behaviors, okay? Well, again, notice that the training data doesn't include any of this oscillatory behavior, but uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the physics uh, part, you know, the, the, the balance laws include uh, those exponential decay, decay and, and um, die off terms, uh, then, you know, by just a small amount of training data, this model can actually predict into the future quite well. So all they have to do is learn those, the neural network parameters from this small amount of data, and then they can predict into the future and it, and it works quite well, okay? So I also wanna just point out that the Chris Rakakis and the Julia guys uh, have done a lot to promote this term sci scientific machine learning as well. They, they actually have a website, sciml.ai, I believe, and uh, where they're kind of reporting on a lot of their progress within the Julia programming language uh, towards uh, solving these types of problems. Uh, another thing I like about their paper is, you know, if they, they said, uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a model is worth a thousand data sets. And, and I firmly believe that. So I know there's been a lot of uh, kind of uh, excitement around AI and, and uh, machine learning and science and engineering, but uh, you know I'm going to caution that you don't throw away the part we we do know. I mean the, the reality is the the balance laws often do work, and it, and it's really just the constituent of models where the uncertainty is. And so if we can you know use the balance laws where we know they're valid, and uh, you know basically then just use statistical estimation to help us with the constituent of model aspects then we can you know, do a lot more with a lot less data than is needed, right? Uh, less data than is needed otherwise to, to train machine learning models. So uh, to kind of switch gears or motivate why some of this might work in petroleum engineering, we'll start with the most fundamental equation in petroleum engineering, and that is the pressure diffusivity equation. So this equation uh, governs single phase flow uh, for slightly compressible fluid in a porous media with permeability uh, kappa, uh, again, compressibility C, density rho, uh, the fluid pressure would be uh, uh, P. And so this is often, it's also used for, you know, flow in aquifers and other things like that, right? So this is kind of the f fundamental first thing we learn in uh, in petroleum engineering and doing reservoir simulation, single phase flow or pressure diffusivity equation. And often when we uh, learn this in the context of reservoir simulation, we immediately uh, learn some numerical solutions to that. And one of the most common ways to do that would be to just finite difference the, the spatial derivative over here. And so now I have an equation that's in the form of, of the ones that I wrote previously, right? Uh, basically, we want to, the time rate of change of the pressure is approximately equal to this. We have an ODE because we've spatially discretized the, the, the partial derivative and pressure term. And so, 
switching gears for just a minute, I'll come back to that equation, but let's look at what a convolutional neural network does, right? So uh, in, th in this case, you know, Convolutional neural networks are often used in image processing because they're good at kind of picking up structural features in images. And they work by passing a, a filter uh, or window function over the images. And so this, the, the green ones and zeros would basically represent pixels in an image in this case. And you're passing over uh, that uh, window function. And the window function has this kind of stencil. So basically, um, you know, it's one zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And as it passes over, if you have a, a one and a one, then, uh, you know, that's, that's set to, uh, the one and the one are multiplied together. So you have a one, otherwise, you know, if you have a one and a zero, they're, they're multiplied to zero. And then all of those are summed in to what's, what you see on the right, right? So as this stencil passes over, then you get this convolved feature on the right, right here, right? So this is kind of what I want to take away. So in this particular example, the stencil looks like this, but more generically, you could imagine a stencil that has you know, arbitrary weights. So if we, if we return or take this idea and we return to our uh, single phase flow equation that we discretized, we might imagine that that spatial derivative term or the discretization of that spatial derivative term is nothing more than a window function that is, you could treat like a convolutional neural network where the weights are then one minus two, one. And so, you know, the, the idea would be, could we treat the right-hand side or the partial derivative term in this case as a convolutional neural network? And of course we can, we, this has been done quite a bit. And what you'll see in those is that the, the neural network is actually learning the differential operator, right? It learns the stencil. So you can actually go and people that have done this and uh, you can inspect the weights and biases of these types of uh, things. and and see that eventually the, the, the neural network kind of is just learning the differential operator, right? Well, again, we know these balance cells work, so why, why waste all the energy learning the differential operator? Rather, uh, let's, let, you can use some of that um, computational time to learn the things we don't know, right? Um, so yeah, that's just a, to kind of finish that thought there. So this is one example in petroleum engineering at a very high level. And so for what I'm gonna switch into now are some, some concrete examples of real problems that we've looked at uh, in various settings uh, in, in petroleum engineering using these ideas from scientific machine learning. So the first one, uh, maybe not specific to petroleum engineering, but could have applications in, in uh, seismic inversion and other things. and that's, uh, looking at the elastodynamics of heterogeneous materials, right? So in this case, we have an idealized heterogeneous material. It's just a one-dimensional bar that has some type of microstructure, right? And so, you know, just to make things easy, we, we're going to say that, you know, basically every unit cell of the bar has, has some periodic microstructure that looks like this, and it has alternating material properties uh, of stiff and compliant structure. So the dark areas would be stiff and the light areas are compliant. And this repeats throughout the bar, right? Now, our petroleum reservoirs are on the order of, you know, kilometers large. And if we were to try to <clears throat> say, uh, and of course they're heterogeneous. So if we were to try to go down to, you know, the grain size uh, <clears throat> of the rock to try to distinguish between all the different materials, well, we would never be able to solve a very large problem on the scale of kilometers. So what we would like to have is some type of representative model. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm taking a drink. <clears throat> so what we'd like to have is some representative model, some continuum model <clears throat> that uh, can represent, you know, we can solve the problem at large scale, but we'll preserve the small scale dynamics or uh, it, you know, sort of preserve in this case, specifically what we're talking about is the wave dispersion that's due to wave reflection uh, uh, at the, at the you know, substructure level, like the level below which we're, we're going to actually resolve in any type of computational simulation. So, <clears throat> of course, we know if we solve this, you know, <clears throat> with a finite element method, we would typically just use a, a conservation of momentum or Cauchy's momentum equation to solve that uh, with, a, with the linear elasticity constitutive model. 
And because of the different material properties in here, because of these impedance, impedance mismatches uh, between the material properties, you're gonna get lots of wave deflect, reflections. And uh, overall, you're gonna have a lot of dispersive behavior as any wave propagates through, through you. But again, what we'd like to do is not have to resolve every small scale feature in the model. So what we'd rather have is something like this, right? Something where we can just solve a continuum model, but again, capture all the wave dynamics pr uh, precisely. And a local model uh, like Cochin momentum equation doesn't have wave dispersion, right? Uh, it, uh, so one choice of you know, what to do here would be to use a non-local model. And so the non-local model I'm presenting here is something we call paradynamics. And I've written it very, uh, in its kind of most simple form here, but basically you notice that uh, the left-hand side of the equation is, you know, just the, the you know, uh, MA, right? Uh, mass times acceleration. Uh, this is a term that replaces the divergence of stress in the classical Cauchy momentum theory. Uh, and then you have the body forces. So really it's only different from Cauchy theory by this term. And this term can, can be viewed as, as sort of a convolution, right? <clears throat> a convolution operator with some kernel function kappa. <clears throat> and so what we're gonna do in the, in, in the sequel here is basically use this equation in the setting of scientific machine learning. We're gonna solve this equation, but we're gonna replace kappa instead of using some closed form uh, functional form of this, we're gonna replace it with a, an estimation, right? A, mach a machine learning model. And we're gonna see if we can learn what kappa should be from the, the data and, and then see if we can solve this in a continuum sense, right? And so uh, the data in our case is synthetically generated. So we solve the, via the finite element method, the full scale, you know, small scale resolution. So we resolve all of those features of alternating stiff and compliant regions, okay? And then what we'd like to do is then learn the kernel and solve it with uh, this so-called paradynamics, okay? And so this, this is what we do. And, and if you, you'll notice there's two lines there. So FEM is our, is our um, the, the orange line there is our data, if you will, right? That's our reference solution. And the blue line is the paradynamic solution. And you notice there, it says without constraint. Uh, I'll get to that in just a second, but basically, the idea here is that we used a small amount of training data, right? So the training data we used is only here. Now this is this is the midpoint displacement. So the, the wave has already passed through that training data at, at this point. So we only use the first few um, milliseconds for training data. And then uh, we use that to learn the kernel. And then what you see here is the solution with that learned kernel, you know, at the midpoint displacement later in time, okay? And so you see, it, it does pretty well, uh, you know, even, even in this case where I say without constraint. But what we realized is that we, we understand some physics, right, of the homogenization procedure and other things. And so what we can do is we can add a constraint to our objective function, right? So we're adding a physical constraint. And that is basically that uh, in, in one dimension, at least, it's that the homogenized modulus elasticity from local uh, classical homogenization theory uh, corresponds to uh, or it provides a constraint on, uh, on the kernel function, which is represented by this omega here. And we call this a, an, an energy constraint because basically, uh, and, and that's certainly what it is in two, in two dimensions. In one dimension, we can reduce it down to just a constraint on the elastic modulus. But in two dimensions, basically uh, what it is, is it says that the, the total strain energy in any unit cell is constrained uh, by, the, by the energy of the, of the small scale representation so that they're, they're equivalent to each other. And if we just add that little constraint to our objective function and then learn the kernel, uh, we, we get a better answer, right? So if you remember on the slide before, um, there, was a, there was a slight deviation between um, the, the paradynamic model and the, and the reference solution, uh, but, but no, that is no longer. So um, also, you know, what you can show, what we can show here is that our, our testing error, so this is the error in, in testing the model. This is whole data that we did not use in training, right? Um, well, we, 
we can, uh, as a function of how much data we use, right, uh, can be greatly reduced by implementing this energy constraint, right? So if we have this energy constraint on the objective function, we need a lot less data to have an accurate solution, right? We can get there without the constraint as well, but we need a lot more data uh, in, in there. So that's what this is meant to represent. Um, the idea here is even more um, evident, self-evident in, in two dimensions. So in, in two dimensions, uh, we have this kind of microstructure representation. So you have every, every unit cell uh, is, is some stiff material with a, with, a, with a compliant material inside it. We've tested this on various representations. It works for all of them. Uh, but again, the idea is if you use, uh, you know, again, the, the training data is, is just this first increment of data. And then the prediction is, is to the right of that. And you can see that, you know, if you don't include this energy constraint, well, it doesn't do a, a great job uh, predicting. And if you, if you do include the energy constraint, again, with just a small amount of data, we can do a, a good job in predicting the wave dispersion uh, in, into the future, right? So, th so that's one example um, for, you know, wave mechanics or elastodynamics. Uh, a second example I'm gonna use here is the so-called Buckley-Leverett problem. So if, you, um, if you've ever been through a petroleum in engineering curriculum, there's no way you got out without learning the Buckley-Leverett problem, right? So it is, it is the classic kind of problem uh, solution that we solve for um, one-dimensional multi-base flow. And the nice thing about it is it, it has, a, it has an, a, a semi-analytic solution that can be derived uh, by using the method of characteristics. So in this case, um, you can think of a, a two-phase fluid, a so-called black oil model that contains water and oil. And if you write the total mass balance uh, and the mass balance of just the water, then you have these two equations. You have some relative permeability constitutive laws and you have this so-called fractional flow equation here um, that is basically just, a, a again, uh, it's the, the, the volume fraction of, or the, of the water versus the total uh, flow um, of the water component versus the total, the water plus the oil. And uh, after some assumptions and other things, you can reduce this down to this one dimensional equation here and solve it for the saturation of the water over time. And, uh, and so you get this equation here. And again, there is a reference solution, semi-analytic solution that you can solve this equation with. I mentioned, um, physics informed neural networks earlier. So this is kind of the idea here. You have your, your, your traditional neural network on the left, but then in the loss function, you include uh, you, that the, the estimated U must satisfy some, some function of the differential operators, right? Uh, to compute the total loss. And in this case, I'm, uh, I can't, I'm, I'm assuming in this colloquium that most people are familiar with the architecture of neural networks, but basically the idea is that every one of these nodes in a neural network contain some weights and biases and, and you can have multiple hidden layers and the, the output of one is fed into the other. And, um, and, then, and then the idea is that, you know, during the training process, the, you're, you're basically optimizing or minimizing the objective function by tuning these weights and biases. So the W's and the B's. And there's also this so-called activation function that's applied to the output of each layer. So this is some function, some nonlinear function to provide some nonlinearity. So uh, a group out of Stanford looked at this. I mean, I think it's just a, the appropriate thing to do if you're gonna look at using physics informed neural networks or any new technology in petroleum engineering uh, to apply it to the buckley levert problem because it, it's, it's such an important problem. Um, and, and they looked at this and they, and they showed that, you know, given a, a, in this case, the constitutive model is this flux function, if you will. And as long as the flux function is, is concave, has this kind of shape, uh, then you can train the neural network quite well to represent the solution of the bucket lever problem. So this is the solution at various times, uh, non-dimensionalized times. Uh, through, but basically you have this water saturation front that propagates along a spatial dimension and you can see as it propagates in time. And the neural network is able to learn, the, the, the PN, the uh, physics informed neural network is able to learn quite well this solution. However, if you have this kind of non-convex flux function, which is 
if you put in real material property data for most of these types of problems, this is what you end up with, a non-convex flux function. Uh, well, all of a sudden, the neural network failed to be predictive um, on these types of problems. Uh, likewise, if you have a convex flux function, the neural network failed to be predictive. And so what uh, this group out of Stanford did was they, they said, well, if we take our, our you know, traditional Buckley lever problem and we add this extra kind of artificial diffusion term and, and then see what happens as we let this small parameter that multiplies the artificial diffusion tend towards zero, then let's see what happens. And if you use, you know, for an appropriate choice of this by adding this sort of extra artificial diffusion term, you can get this thing to converge um, to, to the uh, reference solution for both the non-convex and the convex case as well, okay? Uh, and so here's kind of a, a representative of what happens to the loss function. Um, so this is loss function versus number of uh, epochs in a, in a training of a neural network. And you can see for large values of, um, for large values of epsilon, then it converges really quickly. But as you approach zero, which of course zero would be the, the, the real problem we're trying to solve, then you, you, you get this sort of non or even divergence cases uh, of the loss function. So um, we took a different approach to solving this problem. We used something called a, what we'll term HP variational pen. Uh, so the HP comes from you know, the, the idea behind uh, finite element theory where you can have, you know, basically a, a density refinement or refinement of the number of subdomains um, or that you're solving the equation on, or you can likewise uh, increase the smoothness of your test functions. Okay. And so, um, and that's where the P comes in. And variational is because instead of uh, putting the strong form into the objective function, we're actually going to put in the weak form of the objective. So if we have the strong form over on the left, instead of solving that along with the boundary conditions in our physical form neural network, we're going to solve the weak, weakened form multiplied by some test function over, and we're gonna split this integral into some number of subdomains. So the subdomains would represent by the number H and the smoothness or the number of test functions rather uh, would be represented by the number, the, 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 the number P. So then our total loss function becomes something like this, where basically we have uh, this loss function, the weakened loss function um, from the HPV pin plus the boundary conditions and other things and the data, right? So we have uh, this, this entire uh, loss function. Just some ideas of, uh, more for what you can uh, kind of understand of, of HP refinement. In this case, we're using Lagundra polynomials for our test functions. And so this is what it would look like what are with uh, five polynomials used, used on each of two subdomains. Uh, this is increasing the order of P. So now we have 10 polynomials on two subdomains. And we also just show an example where you have five polynomials used in five subdomains. So this would be P refinement and this would be H refinement. Now, of course, in finite element theory that we have, we have theory that defines, you know, um, you know, exactly how to construct uh, the test functions and other things so that you can uh, have optimal convergence in whatever you norm you want. Well, we're just getting started uh, with this. So we, we don't have any kind of theory or anything like that. So what I'm gonna show in the, in the next few slides are just some early preliminary examples that we've, we've done with, with these. And so in our case, again, we're solving the Buckley-Levitt problem. So this weakened form uh, that goes into the loss function is the Buckley-Levitt problem. And uh, you can see that, you know, given various levels of refinement for H and P, we can do a good job solving this uh, for a convex or non-convex um, flux function, as well as, um, you know, we're not adding any kind of artificial diffusion or anything like that. Um, uh, I think what's more interesting than simply, because basically when you're doing a pin, you're just replacing your partial differential equation discretization and solver technology with a neural network. And, and you're kind of doing it in a somewhat willy-nilly fashion, often the case when you just use large neural networks and other things. Um, 
and, and so, you know, what we, I, I don't think that, and, it, and you know, it takes a long time to train these neural networks. You have to retrain them for every balance law. And I just don't think that this is a useful thing to do. We have great PDE solvers, you know, why, why do that, you know? Um, but however, what I'm about to present here within the context of the same problem is I think much more interesting. And that is if we, if we have true data, right? If we have data, can we solve the inverse problem in that can we, can we find what the flux function should be, right? And so what I'm gonna present in, the, in the what follows is, is two examples, one where we have just random scattered data and, and another where we have, um, you know, evenly spaced data at, at X equal to one, right? So this is the space time domain. And what this would represent would be something that we could actually achieve in an experimental setup in a petroleum engineering laboratory. You have a one dimensional uh, core, you flow water in one end and water and oil come out the other end and you measure the saturation on the, on the other end. In this case, the other end represented by X equal to one at various times, right? So this type of data collection is very straightforward. In fact, we do it all the time. There's nothing new here. So given this type of data, can we find what this flux function should be? That is the constitutive model, right? And the neat thing about this is that we can use the pin or the V pin in its exact same form. It's just now we add a second neural network. Uh, the second neural network is basically to represent the flux function. Right? So we have an initial neural, the first neural network that I showed in the previous solution just represents the solution U. Now we have a second neural network that represents the flux function as well. And we have a couple of additional constraints. Um, you know, the, the, the first one is that the, the well, we, we just constrain it to that the solution equals the data on the boundary where we have data. And we also know certain, some things about the flux function. For example, it should be zero. Um, at zero and it should uh, at be one at one. So uh, for a value of one, uh, the flux function should be zero for a value of saturation of zero and it should be one for a value of saturation of one. And so we add these additional constraints to our objective function. So the old loss function plus these two new values. And then um, here's what we get. So now I'm showing you, we train the neural network. And the interesting thing about this is that at the same time we're training the neural network solution, we're also training the constitutive model. So in one shot, we get, we get the inverse solution, that is the constitutive model, as well as the, uh, you know, an estimator for the solution uh, in, in any spatial and time location uh, for the partial differential equation. And you can see it works. It works for the scattered data case, and it also works for the, the case where all of the data would just be taken on one end of the sample, again, data that we typically collect in a petroleum engineering laboratory. So I think this is a lot more useful thing to do than, to, than just uh, straight pins is a, you know, use them for inverse problem solving um, uh, where we have, it, okay? So along, along those Id ideas, I wanna switch gears for just a second to talk about some computational considerations and then we'll kind of revisit a similar inverse type problem, right? So let's let's imagine our single phase flow problem from before, uh, where you know this is the equation, except before we had a, a kappa over mu or something we call the mobility that sits right here. So that is the constitutive relationship, right? And and we want to basically learn the parameters theta that minimize this overall objective function, where the data and the solution of the the valence law agree with each other, right? And in, in some norm quality quantity. Well, to do that, right, we have to, to find the theta, we have to basically compute the gradients of this loss function with respect to theta. But notice there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a derivative term here, right? And, and there's, a, there's a spatial derivative and there's a time derivative, which means we have to compute derivatives with respect to theta through the solution of the differential equation, right? And, there's no readily available tool set to do that. We can't just we can't just compute gradients through the solution of abacus, right? I mean, abacus being the finite uh, common finite element solver, commercial finite element solver, right? We can't just stick a neural network in the middle of it and compute gradients through it. I mean, you might imagine doing it through some type of um, finite differencing scheme, or you'd have to write your own adjoint, which is often done. But uh, the nice thing about 
you know, the re one of the reasons that neural networks are so popular right now is because there's really great frameworks to work with them, construct them, and to and to train them, right? And and namely, what I'm talking about are you know the the tensor flows and pi torches of the world. Um, you know, some great ones in the Julia community too, uh, uh, Flux, for example. And what I'm going to show in the next few slides is is JAX, right? So if you're familiar with Python uh, as a programming language. Um, uh, of course, TensorFlow is the neural network framework from, uh, from uh, Google and PyTorch is Facebook's, but the Google uh, Alpha, the uh, brain guys, uh, 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 sorry, DeepMind uh, branch of Google uh, created this JAX, which is essentially, if you're familiar with uh, the data structure program NumPy for numerical computing within the Python world, JAX is a uh, almost one-to-one -one compatible with the syntax of NumPy and all the operations that you're used to in the NumPy world. But what it also allows it for all the computations to be done on GPUs, along with uh, compiled to run on GPUs, all, along with automatic differentiation, right? So I can take you know, any function and compute gradients with respect to that function. Um, again, compiled and on GPUs, so you know, really fast. And so, um, what we could do is instead of you know trying to use some off the shelf tools, we could write our own finite element solver, for example, within one of these neural network frameworks, and then do everything within the neural network framework to to try to say to learn what some constituent model would be. And you know I, I know in academia we're supposed to write papers, but since this includes so much code, I decided to write a blog post about it instead. You can find it here, johnfoster.pg.utexas.edu. And all of the code uh, for what I'm about to show you is there. It's, you, know, you can download it as a Jupyter notebook and run it on your own computer. But I mean, here's the beauty of, of Jack. So if I, if, I, if I write a finite element solver, if I write a finite element model for my single phase flow, um, equation and I write it in residual form. So in this case, I have a function that just takes some values of P and returns the residual values of that function, right? Well, I can basically write my own Newton solver within this JAX framework very simply. I mean, by, by basically just, I just call this Jacobian forward on that function and that automatically constructs the tangent stiffness matrix for me. And then I can just pass that into uh, you know, a linear solver and all of this, you know, you notice everything has Jax as a, a sort of a namespace. All of this is automatically differentiable. So this is one step, you know, so this is just one step of a nonlinear solver in my Newton iteration. And I can do this, you know, and then I can compute gradients through the nonlinear solver, uh, you know, to train my neural network. And so uh, again, this is just Jax is NumPy plus SciPy with GPU, TPU acceleration, just-in-time compilation, and automatic differentiation. And so here at my blog, you can find all the code for this problem as a representative uh, model. And so what, I, what I'm going to show you here is um, on the left-hand side is the solution to the forward equation, right? So given this constitutive model, this mobility function, kappa over mu in my single phase flow equation, this is the solution to the equation using the finite element method. And so what I then do is I take that same code that I used to generate the forward solution. And instead of putting in a, a smooth function like this for uh, the mobility function, I just replace it with a neural network. And in this case, it's a tiny neural network. It, it only has four, four nodes in a single hidden layer. It uses a 10H activation function. And I embed that inside the solution of, you know, inside my finite element solver that was all written in JAX. And then I can just pass that over and have it trained. And you can see that the trained neural network then represents uh, the true solution, you know, the, the, the actual, you know, it learned the constitutive model quite well. And the benefit of this is that once we have this learned solution, then we can use our standard finite element solution technology to solve the problem with different boundary conditions, right? So going back or contrasting this with your physics informed neural networks, every time you, you solve those, which again, the solution, the, the training process takes a significant amount of time, much longer than any standard partial differential equation solver would take. 
if you change the boundary conditions, you have to go through the whole learning process again, right? In this case, we've only used the neural network to re represent the constitutive model. We've embedded inside a standard finite element solver, albeit one that I wrote from scratch, I mean, but the, the methodology is standard. Um, and, and, and then, you know, once we have the model, once we have the learned model, then we can solve the problem with different boundary conditions. So for example, if I change the, you know, change the boundary conditions using the same neural network, then here's the solution um, you know, with the two problems. So using the functional form and using the neural network with different boundary conditions, I get the same exact solution, right? And again, uh, this is very fast. Everything happens quite nicely. So I think in, in summary, uh, I just kind of showed some high level examples there, but in summary, with SciML models, we can learn with small data. You know, uh, I think my last example illustrates that quite well in, in that, you know, it's a very small neural network uh, that, we, uh, that, that we need to train there. And because it, it's small, we can, you know, it can be interpretable. You know, a typical neural network that you'd use in a pen would have, you know, several hidden layers and possibly hundreds of nodes, each which contain their own weights and bias terms. And you know, if you tried to look at what the functional form of those equations are, uh, it's very, very difficult to, to have any kind of interpretability. But with these small, small neural network models embedded inside traditional solvers, um, you know, we can we can just essentially expand out the terms of the model and and uh, and look at the and you know have some visual representation of exactly what the physics of the equation of the constitutive equation are. And, and like several of the examples that I've shown here, we can extrapolate well as, as well because we have the balance law as part of the solution technology here. Uh, in summary, I just like to, we have a, a consortium that I'm a member of at, uh, or, or co-PI on at, at UT called Direct, that's a digital reservoir characterization technology. And um, you know, we have some sponsors that I list there as well as uh, I have some additional sponsorship from San Diego National Laboratories. If you'd like to learn more about direct uh, here, myself and the co-PIs that work on that, you can find more information about what we do in there uh, with uh, uh, direct.pg.utexas.edu. And, and again, that is a, this is a consortium that's dedicated to looking at data science and machine learning applications in petroleum engineering. So I think with that, I'll, uh, I can uh, go ahead and stop my screen share and happy to uh, answer any questions. Okay, thanks for this nice talk. And if you have any question, you can use the raise your hand button. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Um, very nice uh, talk, John, um, from Chevron. I'm not a petroleum engineer, more from the geophysics side of things. Sure. Um, so I had a question in your in your elastodynamic models. Mm -hmm. So you were using a different formulation where you're actually training like a kernel or a kappa term. Yes. Why not? Is that equivalent to the C, the constitutive, uh, the stiffness matrix, or are you actually the stiffness tensor or are you, it's a, like a stand-in for the stiffness tensor? No, no, it's, it's um, so first of all, they're, they're, they're the, the stiffness tensor, is a constitutional model that is typically used to close the Cauchy momentum equation, right? That's mm -hmm. a that's a local equation in the sense that you know it's 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 uh, pointwise local, and, and the the mathematical solution of that equation does not have any dispersion in it, right? Mm -hmm. So so uh, you know the, those local solutions are not dispersive in any way. What we wanted was a model that has dispersion. Sort of built into it, so so we mm -hmm. use that this non-local model called paradynamics, mm -hmm. which is, is actually a generalization of the Cauchy momentum equation. We can show in closed form that as the region of integration in that equation shrinks to a point, you recover the Cauchy momentum equation for appropriate choice of constitutive model. And so the, the the kernel that we were learning in that model is not the same thing as the stiffness tensor, but it's if if you want to if you want to say it's the non-local analog. It's the paradynamic analog of the stiffness tensor. But in addition to into having the, the, you know, the, the sort of elastic uh, moduli and other things in there, it, it also has information embedded in it about the dispersive properties of the homogenized material. 
So I hope that answers okay. under, under your question. So in learning Kappa, we're not only learning the, the elasticity relationships, mm -hmm. we're also learning the dispersive relationships, again, of the homogenized model, because we're not going to model every, you know, to, to capture all the wave reflections and whatnot, we're not going to model every single grain in a reservoir, right? We, we need to do this at very large scales to, to have any hope to actually solve anything, right? Okay, so this would actually be more correct than just using like a fixed C, right? Uh, in some sense of capturing the the underlying- It'd be more, more correct in, this, in the sense that, I mean, coaching momentum equation is valid. If you can model every single heterogeneous property in the reservoir, which is impossible, right? So right. It, it, I'm not going to say it's more correct than this, the Cauchy momentum equation. It's it's more correct uh, of a homogenized continuum, right? A continuum that is dispersive. We know that from experimental measurements, right? Uh, so it's 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 more correct because we, we capture the dispersive behavior pro, uh, correctly. Okay. Thank you. So while we wait for more questions, I'd like to ask one. So part of this colloquium is how high performance computing could enhance or give some benefit for machine learning techniques. So what would be your take on that, John? Oh, I, 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 don't, I could have a lot to say about that. Uh, and th this is actually, um, I guess, a source of frustration and inspiration. So, you know, um, all of the popular machine learning frameworks uh, have done a great job at you know promoting this kind of array computing, and 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 basically they abstract away the the accelerated computing. That is, if it's a GPU or TPU, they 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 abstract that away from your your traditional API. Right, the user doesn't he can write his code to run on his local laptop, and then he can productionize it to run on a GPU or TPU without changing the code at all because the framework is aware of that, right? Uh, as well as, you know, so where can high performance computing come in is in, in our typical high performance computing environments, we are typically not just interested in running on a single GPU that is useful, but we're also looking at distributed algorithms, right? Because often our problems are too big to fit in the memory of one GPU. Uh, or, and so we often, our traditional clusters are, you know, InfiniBand connected MPI based type things, right? And none of the frameworks have good support for that technology. Some of them have limited support for the distributed computing. And more than that, none of them have optimizers that'll support that kind of technology. And quite frankly, the optimizers aren't really what we'd want to use for scientific computing anyway. We want to use some Newton or quasi Newton method. The best that they have in, in say PyTorch is like your, your second order BFGS type minimizer. So two things high performance computing can do is, you know, we, we and, and honestly, I really believe we should be working with Facebook and Google. They have a stranglehold on it. And if we really want to sort of take advantage of what they're doing, we should be working in PyTorch and JAX and TensorFlow and working with those guys and not developing our own frameworks and some other technology which is I know what we're going to do, but nevertheless, that's, that's my soapbox. Uh, we need solvers that can work with these frameworks on distributed uh, computing environments that would also allow for the, the, the local acceleration, of course, of course, that's the kind of built into the frameworks and we could borrow a lot of that, but we need distributed solvers. We need second order solvers, second order optimizers, Newton, quasi Newton type optimizers uh, that work within the technology of, of this. So GPU acceleration, array computing, and, and, and automatic differentiation everywhere, right? So, okay. um, and, you know, I, I think really um, in this kind of landscape, in my personal opinion, the Julia guys are doing the best job of integrating everything, but, but the user community is just not as large, right? Uh, you know, it's just not as popular in general of a language yet. It may be one day that we all use Julia instead of Python. But right now, you know, Python's eating the machine learning world. And, and uh, so, yeah, we need, we need second order solvers. We need distributed computing uh, within that, within those frameworks. Okay. Thank you. Do we have more questions for John in the chat or does someone want to ask one question?
No. Okay, so thank you again for right. a really interesting talk. And it was, yeah, I think really interesting to learn yeah. more about this new term, scientific machine learning. At least I learned a lot of new things about this new topic. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, see you for the next seminar. Bye.